Good afternoon. Uh, meteorologist Brad Anderson here in the 1011 Weather Center. The weather workshop will be starting in less than a minute and a half, and today we'll talk about volcanoes and weather, so we'll just kind of let everybody uh, sign on here, and we'll start at about 1 o'clock. Good afternoon. We are starting our final weather workshop. Thank you for joining us for the last several weeks. We started in uh, late March and we've continued. Hopefully this has been valuable for you, learning some things uh, during this uh, crazy time. Uh, thank you to Allo who has helped us through this as well. And so today we're going to talk about uh, volcanoes and weather. And and most of the, what we're going to talk about today is how volcanoes affect the short-term weather, or if you will, the short-term climate. There have been studies uh, over uh, maybe thousands and thousands or millions of years that if uh, volcanic activity increases, and maybe this was uh, as the Earth was forming, volcanoes certainly could have helped to form our atmosphere billions of years ago. So volcanoes do play a very important role on the planet. They're they're violent and, and they do cause a lot of destruction, but uh, they do, ca uh, do play a significant part in the development of our atmosphere, especially early on. But like I said, we're going to primarily talk about how they can affect the short-term weather uh, with from just perhaps some single explosions. Again, as I mentioned, uh, there could be uh, times and, and, and periods of time um, where uh, numerous volcanic eruptions were happening simultaneously that could have caused a, more of a uh, a longer term climate uh, change pattern. But again, we're going to talk about, again, just short term uh, conditions. All right, so uh, volcanic eruptions, uh, how volcanic gases react with the atmosphere. Of course, earlier this week, I believe it was on Monday, uh, we, um, uh, well, the anniversary of Mount St. Helens eruption, uh, 1980, 40 years ago. And this is an early image. This is the image of the uh, Mount St. Helens erupting. Uh, just the beginning stages, uh, and Brandon Rector is here as well. He's going to be helping us uh, through this as well as um, t taking your questions and finding your questions later. So what happens? Well, a lot of things happen when volcanoes erupt. Now, of course, it all depends on how much material is pushed into the atmosphere, uh, what type of gases are uh, released into the atmosphere from these uh, eruptions. So basically, there's a lot of stuff going on here, but what we're primarily going to focus on is the CO2. This is the sulfur dioxide, the CO2 there. Um, it does release carbon dioxide as well, but what actually can change the weather, uh, can cool things down, is the sulfur dioxide, which uh, chemical reactions can actually reflect sunlight. If enough particles are in the stratosphere. Remember, where weather happens, the layer of the atmosphere where most of our weather happens, the rain, the clouds, that's the troposphere. Above that layer is the stratosphere. And once material gets into that area, it can actually linger for quite some time. So one of the gases that makes it up there that's critical is the sulfur dioxide. 
and that can actually reflect sunlight back into space. And if there's enough of it, that can create a cooling effect across uh, parts of the world. Usually volcanic eruptions are, don't cause worldwide cooling, but they can cause regional cooling or maybe the northern hemisphere could cool. Again, we're going to go uh, into more detail with that. So volcanic eruptions, and again, this is basically what you get. You get dust and ash particles. The smaller particles can form the dark clouds that shade and cool the area below for a few hours to a few days. Now that's the ash. That's where it can turn day into night, and that's what happened with Mount St. Helens, many locations as the volcano uh, erupted. Uh, noontime was sunny, and then it just became pitch dark as the ash uh, moved through the area. Now, the, the larger particle, particles of ash, they fall out. They fall out, out relatively soon. Uh, a little bit lighter ash may linger, and sometimes very small areas of dust the ash can actually be blown up into the stratosphere as well, and that can actually enhance uh, some of the sunsets and the sun rises by the solar radiation. We talked about this earlier uh, with the uh, sunlight uh, bouncing off and, and scattering and creating the more brilliant sunrises and sunsets, a lot of reds and oranges uh, bouncing off the uh, ash. Now again, we're still talking about sulfur dioxide, Sulfur dioxide from one eruption combines with water to create sulfuric acid. Now the haze of these aerosols can reflect incoming solar radiation for a few months to maybe even a few years in extreme cases, leading to uh, perhaps a brief period of global cooling. Now volcanoes also release a tremendous amount of water vapor and also carbon dioxide. Uh, and at least in the short term, the carbon dioxide is not increasing the temperature does not really contribute significantly to any kind of a global warming. Again, as I talked about earlier, uh, in, in maybe millions and billions of years ago, if there had been an extended period of volcanic eruptions, the carbon dioxide could build up and that could lead to warmer temperatures. For example, I'll give you one quick example. This is only a theory. About 600 million years ago, uh, scientists theorized that the there was an ice age, it was called Snowball Earth. Most of the planet, except maybe the areas around the equator, were actually covered in ice and snow. And they think that it was uh, what's called the Snowball Earth because most of the, the Northern Hemisphere, Southern Hemisphere were covered by these glaciers. Now they think over a millions of years, as volcanic activity increased, it increased the carbon dioxide, which then increased um, the temperature and helped melt uh, that. Of course, there's also orbital things that happen too that could cause melting. So we don't want to go too much into that. I just wanted to point out that maybe a long, long, long period of volcanic eruptions releasing water vapor and carbon dioxide could warm the planet. But again, we are talking about short-term activity here. Okay, so one of the things that scientists use are is called the volcanic explosive index or explosivity index. We have these indexes, you know, we have the EF index for tornadoes, we have the, uh, the Saffir Simpson scale for hurricanes, category one, category three, there's earthquake as well it measures uh, the Richter scale. So basically it's a measure of uh, explosiveness of volcanic eruptions. Scale is open-ended with the largest volcano eruptions in history, given a magnitude eight. Value zero, of course, is for the, the non-explosive ones, and of course the eight represents the mega colossal explosive eruption. So this will become important as I talk a little bit more. Uh, the scale is log logarithmic from uh, the VEI two and up, meaning that an increase of one index, so like from one to two or two to three, indicates an eruption that is 10 times as powerful. All right, so we're gonna move on. We're gonna talk a little bit about some volcanic eruptions, some famous volcanic eruptions. Uh, Tambora, Indonesia, 1815. We're gonna talk more about this one in a little bit. Uh, 90, 92,000 people were killed from this volcano. The Santorini one in Greece back in 1628. Unknown casualties, that was a six out of again the scale up to eight. Krakatoa, this was in 1883. This was a very destructive volcano, again, in the Indonesia area. Uh, there were a lot of um, uh, tsunamis. Earthquakes can cause tsunamis. 36,000 people plus killed. The Santa Maria Guatemala, 1902, 6,000 people lost their lives. Mount St. Helens 
was a, had a VEI rating of a five, uh, 57 casualties, not necessarily a lot of people because a lot of people evacuated, plus it was an area that didn't have a lot of population. It didn't really affect any major cities. Vesuvius, this one you might have heard of, uh, 79, 79 AD, uh, buried the cities of uh, Pompeii and uh, Herculeum. Did I say that right? Sure. Okay, thank you. I know it starts with an H, but Pompeii, you'll, you know, they unburied that ash centuries later and they discovered that time was frozen uh, because of, of all that ash that happened with Vesuvius and 3,360 people lost their lives there. A more recent one, and another one we're going to talk about, is Pinatubo in the Philippines in 1991. That was a five. Mount Pele in Martinique, one of the Caribbean islands, 1902. This killed almost 30,000 people. And again, you can kind of see the velocity, the, the, again, the, the VEI of the Mount Pele one is four. So you think, okay, well, it's not that destructive, but it depends on what's around there, the cities and stuff. In fact, the picture that you see right there, the black and white picture, that is a picture of the Mount Pele eruption back in 1902. But there was a town there that uh, was completely obliterated by it, and that's why there were high casualty rates. Uh, Nevado del Ru, I think, in Colombia, 1985, that was a three. And then uh, one in Japan in 1792 was a two, but also caused 15,000 casualties because, again, Depends on where people are living, where high populations are, tsunamis and things like that. Okay, so those are just some of the ones in recent histories. Now, several of these eruptions have caused global changes to weather. We're going to talk a little bit about the 1991 Pinotubo eruption in the Philippines. It did call, uh, create cooler than normal temperatures uh, worldwide. Brilliant sunsets and sunrises. We talked about that. That was attributed to the ash and the gases sent into the atmosphere. Uh, ash and the gases formed that large volcanic cloud and that drifted around the world in the stratosphere. Sulfur dioxide in this cloud combined with water to block sunlight and it cooled temperatures in some areas by much as half a degree Celsius or almost a degree Fahrenheit. Now I know that doesn't sound like a lot, but when you're talking about that much for the whole planet or at least the northern hemisphere, that is a significant drop. So I wanted to talk a little bit about more on Pinatubo before we move on because I want to talk a little bit about the impact on the Lincoln climate. Uh, 1993, now it doesn't happen immediately. The volcano, volcanic eruption happened in 1991, but we didn't start to feel the effects until 92 and 93. In fact, 1993 in Lincoln was the third coldest year in Lincoln. In 1992, the summer of 1992, there were 15 90 degree days, 90 plus days, normal, Brandon, you know this, 41. Normal 90 yep. degree days in Lincoln is 41. That's how much we should have during the summer. So there were only 15 in 1992 and only 19 90 plus days in 93. And both of those years, we never even got to 100. In fact, uh, almost uh, uh, no 100 degree days in those two years. And we normally should have almost five. And the hottest temperature in 1992 for the whole year was only 93 degrees. So. Uh, it did cause some cooling, and uh, the summer of 92 on the, for the United States was the third coldest uh, summer uh, due to the Pinatubo eruption. Now, again, I kind of remember this. I remember this happening, and to me, because of the, 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 the ultraviolet light being reflected and the sunlight being reflected back into space, I just kind of remember, I don't know if you remember, Brandon, but it just seemed like it wasn't very bright that summer. It just, you know, even on a sunny day, it just seemed like it was a little bit dimmer. Again, you know, maybe that was in my imagination, but it just, it just did not seem like a, a bright summer. And, and it, so obviously that could have been 92, 93 due to uh, Pinatubo, which was a, a, again, a violent eruption. All right, let me go back to that because I skipped ahead. I wanted to go back to, before we start talking about Mount St. Helens, I'm going to have to probably go through this again, so excuse me for this. Uh, we're just going to go through all this again because we're going to talk about uh, some other volcanic eruptions. The 1815 eruption of Tambora in 1815. This is another Indonesian volcano in, in Indonesia. And this was a very violent one, possibly the most violent in recorded history. And that's, again, human recorded history, obviously 
the Earth goes way back before before humans. Um, now this volcanic eruption may have cooled the atmosphere by three degrees Celsius uh, over five and Fahrenheit. Now this may have led to what people know as know as the summer, the year without summer, 1816. Brandon, uh, a year before my time. Yeah, well, it, it was uh, you know a year or two after my birth, but anyway, <laughs> as we say. Uh, Again, it caused very cold conditions across Europe. There were, there were crop failures in some locations. And even in the United States and in New England, there were reports of frost and freezing conditions in July. And crops failed in New England and Pennsylvania. There was even reports of some snow in New England in July. And there were a lot of crop failures in there. Now, we don't know what was really going on here in the middle part in Nebraska because 1815, there were not a lot of... Uh, American settlers that had moved into this area to keep any kind of record or any kind of uh, memory of it. Uh, so again, this was 1815. So even a year after the eruption, most of the northern hemisphere had sharply cooler temperatures during the summer months. And of course, as we mentioned, 1816 was known as the year without summer. Another thing about that that was interesting, that a little bit of history here for you, uh, not only cooled in the United States, but also in Europe, Mary Shelley, who was the author of Frankenstein, they were staying in some chateau in Geneva, Switzerland, and it was very cloudy, cold, and wet all summer. They couldn't do a lot of activities. It was not a typical summer, so she was encouraged to write a story, and she eventually came up with the story of Frankenstein. So there's that for you. Yeah, so that is a possibility how it might have affected some literature. All right, let's move on here. Uh, and let's talk a little bit about Mount St. Helens because that's the one that, that we talked about earlier, 40th anniversary on Monday. This was a five, so that's a healthy explosion. But it didn't have a lot of sulfur dioxide. It had more ash. So remember what I told you about sulfur dioxide is the one that reflects the sunlight back into space. So therefore, the cooling was not that significant, only about a tenth of a degree Celsius. So it was a smaller eruption. Now below this, we won't see a picture of this, but uh, El Chichan, which uh, was in Mexico, that erupted in 1982. It, the, the eruptions were similar. You can see the VEI was a five, but it contained more sulfur dioxide. So there was actually a cooling pattern in the 82, 83 of about a half a degree uh, basically about a degree Celsius, or excuse me, Fahrenheit of cooling. Again, I know that doesn't sound like a lot, but that was a cool down. The only thing that may have tempered the cooling was a phenomenon called El Nino, which actually can cause warmer conditions. And that's a, that's a more of a meteorological uh, ocean event. It has nothing really to do with the volcano, but it might have been worse had we not had an El Nino year in 82. So that was the Chichan one. That one uh, happened a couple of years later, same size eruption, but again, more sulfur dioxide was released into the atmosphere. All right, now we're going to talk about super volcanoes. This is what keeps Brandon up at night. Yes, <laughs> one okay. of many things. Yes, one of many things. Okay, <laughs> believe it or not, maybe you've heard this before, Yellowstone, the Yellowstone National Park, basically sits on a super volcano. That's right. Uh, the last eruption was 630 thousand years ago and at the time the, the theory is at this point that the climate was warming was naturally warming back then but this eruption may have slowed things down for a few decades now here's something interesting that has Nebraska ties now again there were this is called a hot spot so it wasn't just in Yellowstone but you even go back to 10 to 12, 12 million years ago there was the super volcano that exploded and this buried parts of Nebraska with a lot of ash. And uh, you may have heard of this. This is Ashfall Fossil Beds State Historical Park near Royal Nebraska in Northeast Nebraska. Uh, a lot of animals were buried with the ash uh, in this. So there's uh, fossilized uh, skeletons that have been found there and you can go visit this uh, historical site. And you can actually see these animals that were basically buried by the eruption of the, a super volcano in the Yellowstone area 10 to 12 million years ago. No indication of any kind of significant climate change or just uh, not known at the time. But again, that's just uh, some historic now of data on the Yellowstone volcano. Now, 
I've read a lot of stuff on this, Brandon. It does not look like we need to worry about a super volcano in Yellowstone at this time. Okay, that's good. All right, so there's no signs, indications that we're gonna have a big explosion. Explosion. Now here's another volcano, super volcano, called Toba. And this may have possibly been the largest eruption in human history. Remember I said earlier about recorded history. That's when man started recording things, historic history uh, books or history uh, parchment paper. Humans, of course, go back a lot farther than that, you know, back 300,000, 500,000 years. So this possibly may have been the biggest explosion in human existence. And that was 70 to 75,000 years ago. And this may have caused up to 10 years of what we call the volcanic winter. That's what we're talking about when it kind of affects uh, maybe for a couple of years. But this was so extensive that 10 years may have been impacted with the cooling of the planet. Now, there is a theory. I have to point out that there are some scientists that don't think Toba had anything to do with this. But there is a theory that came out several years ago that the human population shrank to less than 10,000 people on the entire planet. Not that there were a lot of people to begin with at this time, but because of the possibility of this uh, super explosion, it may have reduced uh, flan uh, excuse me, plants and animals, and so therefore there was possibly a human population that had died off only to less than 10,000 people. So that is a theory. Some people disagree with that. But, uh, I mean, they're, they're, the fact is they do know that there was less than 10,000 people. They just don't know. Some of the scientists just don't know if this volcano caused that reduction in people. So I just wanted to point that out about the Tobo volcano uh, 70 to 75,000 years ago. So uh, I want to thank, again, meteorologist Jan Ryherd for the graphics. Also, Bill Rentschler contributed to this. And also wanted to point this out before we go to questions. Look at this, Brandon. It's the last one. Ooh. Congratulations, you all have completed successfully the 1011 weather workshop. So isn't that exciting? That is exciting. And the fireworks and everything there for you. All right. All right. So what do we have for questions about volcanoes and weather today? Well, we've got quite a few here. So okay. um, Renee was wondering about uh, carbon dioxide. You know, what is it? What is it? What is it made of? Carbon dioxide is uh, the carbon molecule, and then it has uh, two oxygen uh, molecules on it. So that's what it's made out of. It's carbon and then, uh, of course, the oxygen. So it's fused together. So that's what carbon dioxide is. Uh, carbon dioxide is actually very important. It's actually what, if you will, work with me, plants breathe that in, or they use the carbon dioxide, and then the plants, the trees, the grass, the flowers, they release oxygen. So plants, carbon dioxide, they breathe it, if you will, they use it, and then they release oxygen. So carbon dioxide, very important. Uh, there's, very, there's not that much in the atmosphere. It's, uh, it's only about 0.03% of the atmosphere, whereas you have oxygen, which is 21%, of the atmosphere. You know what the big one is? You know what it is. Nitrogen. Yep. 78%. Nobody ever really hears about nitrogen, but yet our atmosphere is 78% yep. nitrogen. So, so that's what CO2 is. And again, CO2 is what we call a greenhouse gas because as it goes into the atmosphere, it can uh, prevent temperatures or heat from going back into the outer space. So it can actually keep the, the heat in so in theory, it starts to, the planet can start to warm up. But water vapor is also what we call a greenhouse gas and also methane. But uh, again, carbon dioxide, uh, you know, if it increases uh, in the atmosphere over time, that could lead to uh, temperatures that are warmer uh, globally. So what else do we have? Liam from Soresco would like to know, can volcanoes cause tsunamis? Yes, volcanoes uh, can cause tsunamis, and there have been several cases of uh, tsunamis. I mentioned uh, Krakatoa back in 1883 in Indonesia caused massive tsunamis and probably was the main reason for the loss of life. Maybe not even so much the volcanic explosion itself, 
but actually the tsunami. What tends to happen is you have an explosion, you may have like a, a landslide that just crashes into the ocean and then makes a huge, huge wave, and of course that can uh, impact uh, land areas. So yes, volcanoes can cause uh, tsunamis just as much as earthquakes can. Dave must have been listening to our last weather workshop uh -huh. because this was brought up oh, for really? today because it, it kind of coordinated with uh -huh. okay, about how Krakatoa changed weather back in 1883. Mm -hmm. Do you know one of the things that happened that we would have talked about Tuesday that could have happened with Krakatoa? Oh, my gosh. Is this a stumper? Is this a Brad no, stumper? No. Oh, <laughs> We talked about full moons. We talked about full moons, right. And the blue moon came up. So okay. I'm leading us down the path of volcanic ash causes the moon to look blue. Okay. So that's the question? No. I mean, the question, <laughs> it was brought up. Ken, oh, Ken I and I were going to see if anybody was paying attention and would oh, bring okay. it up and to see if they would ask you about it since you were talking about volcanoes because somebody asked the question about blue moon, where it came up from. Okay. A little research I did found out that one of the early instances of a blue moon was with Krakatoa. Oh, okay. And the ash causing blue moon. Yeah. And it's actually other volcanoes we have seen blue moons out of. That, of the eruptions. Well, that totally makes sense. I see where you're going now. You, yes. you give me some time, Brandon, and I I'll catch up. I took the winding path. Yes, yes. No, yeah, but exactly. Just like with the sunsets, the brilliant orange and the red and some purples, with, when you have a lot of ash in the atmosphere, they can also cause uh, the blue moon to be, or the moon to appear bluish. I was confused because the blue moon technically means that there are two full moons in one month, right. so once in a blue moon. But, but you're yes. right, yeah, the, the ash can cause the appearance to uh, be bluish, so thank you. Yes. <laughs> thank Hopefully you we for, didn't lose anybody well, on that one. That was, I was, I was oh. lost for a while there, but thank you for rescuing me, bringing me in there. Hopefully we brought it all back. That's uh, right, exactly. <laughs> We just took the very scenic route. Yes. Uh, Aiden from Zoresco, how are volcanoes active from year to year? Uh, right about one that's been active for over 30 years. Does that also mean it's still spewing lava? Uh, is, are you talking about Kilauea? I think there is. I mean, there are active volcanoes all over the world. Uh, but Kilauea, the one in Hawaii, is, is one that's been active for a long time. Now, those type of volcanoes, those are called shield volcanoes, and they rarely have explosive, violent eruptions. They're very, comparatively, very gentle. Now, they spew a lot of lava, and of course, in time, they could impact and maybe uh, move into a town or a village, and so that certainly is a problem, but they don't change weather because they don't violently explode. They don't send material all the way up into the stratosphere. So. The shield volcanoes, like the one in Hawaii and even the one, uh, some of the ones that are in Iceland, uh, usually will not cause any kind of short-term weather problem. They do release gas, volcanic gases, sulfur dioxide, things like that, but again, not enough to get into the stratosphere to cause any significant problems. We're talking about the violent strato-composite volcanoes that erupt very violently. All right, uh, Cynthia wants to know, is volcano sulfur different from the sulfur at Yellowstone? Does the volcano have that egg smell to it? Uh, that's a great question, and that's exactly the same smell that the volcanoes release. That sulfur smell, that, that is it. As Remember, Yellowstone, uh, it's not a vol active volcano right now. It's what we call dormant or sleeping but all the steam that you see the smell or see and the sulfur that you smell, that indicates that it is geologically active. And so uh, the water, it trickles down, uh, down through the rocks and then it gets heated. And then of course you have a release of steam as that water boils and then you smell the sulfur and then you have the other conditions there as well as the sulfur. So great question. Yes, that is related. The sulfur is related to the volcanic activity. Karen would like to know what's different. What's the difference between a super volcano and a regular volcano? Okay, the super volcano just means that they are very violent, or they have released a tremendous amount of material in the atmosphere. We're talking about the sevens and the eights, and those are the ones uh, that don't happen very often. Thank goodness, uh, anywhere. 
Uh, most of the volcanoes that we've had recently, like the Mount St. Helens one was a five, uh, and the, the Pinatubo one, I believe, was a, was a five, again, in 1991, or actually a Pinatubo was a six, so it certainly was a strong one, but again, things like uh, Mount St. Helens was a five. You could call that kind of a, a regular volcano, uh, but again, the super volcanoes, those are ones that are seven or an eight and can cause uh, significant problems, and again, we might not have had anything like that on the planet uh, for 630,000 years. The last time the supervolcano Yellowstone exploded might have been the last supervolcano, and it's been a long time. They don't erupt very often, thank goodness. Holly would like to know, has there ever been an earthquake, volcanic eruption, and a tsunami at the same time? Oh, I'm sure there is. Um, sometimes earthquakes, because all the magma, which is lava below the surface, and the magma it moves around, it begins to shuffle around as it starts to heat and tries to start to climb up to the surface, that can cause a lot of earthquakes. And then it's an earthquake that actually triggered the, uh, the St. Helens uh, eruption was we had a big earthquake and then there was a landslide on this big bulge on Mount St. Helens and that released the pressure and then all that ash and violent or gases violently exploded into the atmosphere. So volcanoes and earthquakes actually go hand in hand. And then of course, if you're by the ocean, you can have a tsunami as uh, that material will slam into the ocean and create a large uh, tsunami. And a lot of times when the volcanoes erupt, uh, this wasn't part of the question, but a lot of times there's a lot of lightning, a lot of static uh, going on there. So there actually can be lots of lightning in the volcanic ash cloud. All right, so I guess we've got time for one more question here. Yeah, let's do one more question. And, and Haley is wondering, will we do the weather workshop next year? I do not know that. I mean, uh, I've had fun doing this. I know Brandon's had a great time, of course. Uh, this has been a lot of fun. This was kind of a, a special event because, you know, everybody was out of class, and this was just some, some science, some meteorological information. Never say never. Never say never. I can't say we won't do it, but, you know, you could be in class at this time. So, I mean, in fall, you're hoping that you're in your classroom, you're in your school, and uh, you won't be needing this. But uh, you never know. We might do something. We might have something maybe different, maybe a different name. We don't know. But uh, I hope you all enjoyed this with all the subjects we've talked about over the last six weeks or so. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. I want to thank again Jan Ryherd as well as meteorologist Bill Rentschler who put a lot of stuff together. Brandon Rector, of course, has come in answering the questions, doing research for us as well. Uh, thank you to Ken Schimmick uh, for uh, doing his part on Tuesdays. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. And just remember, uh, I want to go back to this one again. Congratulations. You have successfully completed the 1011 Weather Workshop. I'm kind of proud of this one because I kind of made it and I wanted to show it again. There you go. Yeah, yeah it's a good one. Thank you. And, uh, you know, have a great summer. Have a safe summer. That's, you know, I know maybe not be able to do a lot of things. We'll have to hopefully wait and see. This all kind of calms down. But uh, just remember, have a safe summer. So, again, thank you very much. Thank you for joining us over the last six weeks. And thanks to Allo and everyone involved.